everyone. My name is Frank Jaskalki with the Medical Alley Association, and I'm so pleased that you're spending a little bit of time this morning to join us for a really important discussion, one that uh, we've heard from so many of you is a, a topic at the top of your mind, one that you're looking for ideas, you have ideas to share, and one that we know is central to the growth of this ecosystem and to each of your individual businesses. We've got a great group of panelists with us today to discuss the topic, to share their perspectives, their experiences, and what they've learned. And as we're going through this, one thing I'd ask you, if you have questions, you'll see down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. Any question you have, type it into the q and I'll be moderating that and I'll pull the questions into the discussion. They may not get answered immediately, or if it's a question that we'll address in another part of the discussion, I may end up just saying, hey, it's been answered, and we'll bring it up later. But any question you have, any time, put it into that Q&A function. And if we don't get to your question during the discussion, we save them all and we try to follow up with you after the discussion to bring you into it. Uh, you're joining us for what is a great webinar today, and we couldn't do these webinars if we didn't have the fantastic support of some great member organizations, two in particular, who have been kind enough to sponsor the Bringing the Future Forward webinar series and our Medical Alley Starts program. So I'm gonna ask them to say just a few words about their organizations so you can learn a bit more. And I'd encourage you to check out their websites, share their info, and if they have services that your company might need to reach out. When you support the companies that support Medical Alley, you help make the whole ecosystem that much stronger. And so to start, I might ask Kevin from Diversified Plastics if you'd say a few words. Yeah, good morning and thank you, Frank. And uh, Diversified Plastics is very excited to be a, a co-sponsor of the Medical Alley Starts program. It's a way for us to uh, create broader awareness for Diversified Plastics in this important community. Uh, we're an employee-owned manufacturer of injection molded and added manufacturing parts. Uh, medical device and med tech is our primary market and our fastest growing market. Uh, in this particular element of the, the starts and emerging medical device companies, uh, what we like to highlight is our additive manufacturing technology, which allows us to help a company get mark products to market much faster, which is important for uh, any market and especially in the medical uh, market. And that additive technology is under our banner of acceleration station, and we're partnering with a company called Carbon and their DLS technology. And with that, once a product is on market, then we're able to bring our legacy injection molding technology into play and support a company from literally start through commercialization and, and uh, continued market presence. And one thing we like to highlight as part of the start sponsorship is a specific grant program for companies that need engineering and uh, additive part production support early stage and early on in their company. We just finished the applicant process for this fall, but look forward again in the spring uh, with another set of uh, applicants uh, willing to uh, work with us and have our technology support them. So you can find out more about that at uh, www.divplast.com or Medical Alley Starts on the Medical Alley Starts page. Thanks, Frank. Kevin, thank you. We really appreciate it. And then I'll ask uh, Keith, the chief guru, at a couple of gurus to say a few words as well. Thanks, Frank. Uh, I'm Keith Schoolcraft, uh, and uh, I've had a wonderful uh, time this year being with this community and and uh, looking forward to uh, continued uh, next year as well. Uh, we are a technology company that um, uh, helps implement support and manage uh, IT technology and strategy. Uh, so uh, whether you're in that beginning phase or you're right about to kind of go into that growth phase uh, and uh, ready to scale uh, what you started because you finally got your funding and you finally uh, are ready to you know, put, put, put the pedal to the metal. Um, we have a lot of fun working with uh, companies like that. Um, and uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful journey to be on together. Uh, so, uh, and we always will start with a technology plan. So, because uh, we want uh, to align your technology with the vision uh, of your organization uh, so that uh, technology becomes uh, an enabler. So, uh, and since it's the end of the year, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year. 
<laughs> right on. Thank you, Keith. Uh, one of the secret sauces of the Medical Alley community, in all honesty, is this incredible consulting supply chain manufacturing community that allows device drug and digital health companies, big and small, to get going and get growing faster. So we really appreciate their support, not only of our members, but of the Medical Alley organization. And with that, I'm going to turn to our discussion at hand. Um, you know, in the last two years, it seems like we've had a decade or 20 years or an entire generation of change happen seemingly overnight. I don't know about you, but time doesn't seem to matter much anymore. And now we're talking about things like the great resignation, wage inflation. Do we go back to the office? Are we going to be fully remote? Are we going to be hybrid? There's just so much going on all at once that I don't think any one person, any one company could ever figure that out all by themselves. And that's one of the powers of this community is that you all come together to discuss these topics, even among competitors, to figure out how could we do this better? Because ultimately, a better workplace means better products, means more patients get helped around the world. And I'm really pleased that today we have two fantastic people joining us for this discussion. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves a little more formally, but I want to start by asking just a, a basic question that I kind of been asking myself every day. And I think a lot of people are asking this, which is just like, how are you doing? And Nikki, maybe I'll start with you. Like, how are you doing through all of this? Uh, your role, the role of HR in so many organizations is helping others to be successful. How are you doing through all of this? Thanks, Frank. I appreciate the, the question because I agree that we don't always, we're focused on the business and helping others. So, you know, uh, personally, I, I actually have some things going on with my family that have added stress and you can imagine how work can be, um, you know, with, with COVID continuing to uh, be a focus for us and how we support and manage our employees. We're obviously going to talk about recruiting and retention today. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you, I think um, I'm doing all right. I've had the opportunity to hire some great talent into my team recently. Um, which has really helped, you know, HR and, and myself uh, provide better support for the organization. And I enjoy the holidays. And so I think this is a great time of year for me to be thankful for the things that I have in my life. But I do recognize that it's not always a happy time for people in their life. Um, so it's something to be sensitive. I know that. So thank you for asking. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. And Nikki, maybe if you would tell us a little bit about um, your work and your role in the organization you're at. Sure. I'm at Smith's Medical, medical device company here, a uh, global one, but we're, our corporate offices are in Plymouth, Minnesota. Um, I've been with the organization actually just over a year, um, and I am the uh, corporate HR director. So I support um, the Americas from an HR business partner perspective, and then all of the global functions that um, go across the United States. So our team is really focused on, you know, really being strategic business partners um, and helping both leaders, um, our executives and thinking how we support and, you know, meet our business results while um, engaging and motivating our employees. Um, prior to that, I worked with Anderson Corporation, um, the largest window and door organization in the um, United States. Um, and I was there for 14 years prior. So. Oh, it's great to have you. And, and I really appreciate you bringing the Anderson perspective, you know, getting perspectives of people who have worked in other industries can help us in med tech and healthcare and biotech to just think differently about our work. Yeah. And then Mark, I'll ask you the same question. How, how have you been doing in all of this? Yeah, thanks, Frank. And, and good to be with you and everybody. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. It's been a roller coaster. Uh, that's that's what I think everybody on the calls probably went through, both professionally with work life and responsibilities of your employees, your customers, and, and from the medical community, their patients, but also family issues. Uh, I know for, for me, it's it's been uh, the ups and downs. I have, I have three teenagers. So with, uh, with school issues. Uh, some kids did great with that when they were locked out of school. Some struggled and, and my family is no different than that. Um, so, but as of now, it, I, I feel I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it may not be bright and shiny and overly welcoming, but it, it seems to be a little more going in a positive direction. So I feel good about that. Uh, my, my role with the Brocco Medical Technologies is uh, VP of Human Resources, been with the organization for a little over eight years. Uh, Brocco Medical Technologies, some of you may be familiar with Assist Medical Systems, the same company. It's a division of Brocco globally. Uh, we are a medical device uh, organization 
my role is to uh, help and support 500 global employees, uh, US, Europe, uh, and throughout Asia. Uh, we've, uh, as an organization, we've had a, a really a, a challenging year, but financially a very wonderful year. Our business has come back. Uh, what the staffing challenges that we have faced, we have overcome a, a bulk of those. Uh, hasn't been perfect, um, hasn't been easy. Um, we've also went through a vaccine mandate. And um, I, I could certainly, if those are interested, uh, share some words of advice, uh, some counsel. Um, one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do in my 30 plus years of HR leadership. Um, and so I, my, I'll give everybody that warning. Uh, if you're going to go do that, um, be very aware of the pros and cons of, of that because it can certainly change the culture of the organization if you're not careful. So uh, welcome uh, to everybody that's on this call and thank you so much for allowing me and Nikki to be here today. You know, and Mark, maybe actually that's just a, a good spot to start because it's definitely a, a topic and a question that's on everyone's mind. Uh, could you talk about that experience of going through a vaccine mandate, the change in culture you reference? Like, how has that been? Um, maybe are there things you'd do differently if you had to start over again? Like, what should we learn from your guys' experience? Yeah, and it's, it's challenging. It, it begins with, at the leadership level, uh, trying to get on the same page. Uh, that, and and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, the differences of opinions matter. Um, uh, and, and you're going to have that, but you need to get aligned, uh, whichever tack you take. And so that was the first uh, challenge that we had. Uh, whether you do this or not as an organization, it's a very deep emotional question. Um, I think, uh, personally, I underestimated what the, the personal hard feelings were going to be of employees. And they're still with us. Our vaccine mandate went into effect mid-November. And here we are mid-December. And there's still some bruises and, and, and bumps to that. And I, I believe that will maintain itself through part of 2022 as we go through that. Um, so uh, having a global organization, of course, it starts with what you can do. Uh, so there's some areas of the, the world, of course, it's, it's not feasible. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., <laughs> some would say even that isn't feasible, as our federal government is finding out. But as a smaller uh, employer here, uh, we were very mindful of the different states uh, and their rules uh, and their concerns. Uh, but what we did is uh, really focused on each individual employee that had concerns. And you literally spend months with them, listening to them, having dialogue with them carefully. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ever predicted as a human resource professional, you have to have personal conversations about religious beliefs and faith at work. But here we are. So if, if you go down this path and you want to have a mandate, be prepared to put the right people in those conversations who, who know how to navigate those waters. They're treacherous. Be prepared to lose great talent. It's going to happen. Um, your job as leadership, if you're going to do that, is to keep that to a, a minimum. Be very flexible in, in terms of what you can do to accommodate and be very open-minded. Challenge your own beliefs. Um, that, that's some of the lessons that we learned. And it was difficult and hard. Lots of arguments throughout the way. But I'm thankful it's behind us. Um, would I, someone asked, would you ever do that again? Probably not would be my answer. Um, there, there are pros to it, though. We have a workforce now that 98% of our, all our employees in the U.S. are vaccinated fully. Um, and we have made accommodations for some um, um, to allow them to continue to work in, in a safe and smart way. So there's a lot, lot, lot to untangle with that, but um, I'm glad it's behind us. Well, I think unanticipated conversations, topics, challenges has been, uh, well, the, the daily thing lately. It's become the anticipated Nikki, I'd be curious, what's been for you the most unanticipated challenge that's emerged uh, throughout this time, or maybe that you see emerging coming into 2022? I, you know, for me, um, it's been around how to handle, uh, we call it contact tracing. And so when we have uh, someone that, you know, has a positive COVID test, um, the amount of, of work and rigor that needs to go into that. And I, I'm proud to say that Smith Medical does a really great job in um, talking with a person that's positive, making sure that they're they're okay, right? We, we care about you. You know, hope you're feeling okay. Um, we've provided emergency pay for our employees 
Um, so if they can't work because they're sick or they can't, you know, they're not an individual that is allowed to work from home because of the role that they're in. Um, we're hoping to help, you know, not have that be a hardship on them as well as use all their PTO. Um, but we also then make sure that anyone that they've had um, contact within a certain period of time, um, we're, we're speaking with those individuals as well um, and doing our due diligence to see if those individuals should um, get tested or need to quarantine. Um, it is a body of work and it is a heavy lift, but um, I'm proud to say that we're doing it as a service to our employees um, and we have a great process we're documenting. So it allows us to track, um, are we seeing the increase in cases? Um, where do we may need to make decisions where maybe we have our workforce that can work remotely for a period of time um, adjust? But it's just a body of work, I think, as you know, Mark talking about the mandate, um, you know, that we in HR take on to support the organization during a time like this in addition to our very busy and full jobs already. Oh, indeed, I, I don't think any of us anticipated that we would, um, we would be in the business of public health delivery, aside from the, the products that our companies manufacture and provide around the world. Um, we had a question come in from the audience that Mark uh, goes over to you. A uh, person's asking, has the internal sentiment changed at all with the ocean federal mandates now on hold in the courts, has that had any impact on how you guys have approached the work or how it's been received? Um, not really. I, I will say this. Uh, we, we announced our vaccine mandate well before anything that was announced at the federal level. Um, mm -hmm. So back in early September, I believe it was, uh, when we were contemplating and then announced we're going to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll share a quick story. We did have an employee, I had an employee reach out to me simply very angry. Uh, about this. They didn't agree with this direction. Uh, uh, part of their anger, and I think a large part of it was related politically. Well, they had this false assumption that we were doing this in support of what they perceived as going to be an up upcoming federal move. That was the furthest from the truth. So as I explained to that person, no, this was truly an internal decision about the safety and well-being of our employees and our patients uh, to maintain our, our business continuity um, that, that was the main driver of this, and that, that helped. Uh, but no, I would say the, we were ahead of the curve on this one. Um, and so we went through this before uh, the federal announcement, and it, but no surprise to me uh, of, the, of the issues that they're running into. Uh, we ran into a lot of those same things when you start crossing business need, uh, personal freedoms, choice, uh, and then you throw in the complicated issues of uh, religious beliefs. Um, reasonable accommodations. It, it's it's a mire. Um, it's a, very challenging for sure. I think yeah. if you don't mind, I can add to that because yeah. Miss Medical actually did announce a mandate back in October based on what the government had communicated. And then um, recently we actually um, communicated to our employees, it was in the United States and Canada, that we were actually delaying that mandate. Um, and so it was interesting because it was about six weeks later um, that we made the decision based on what was going on in the courts, um, uh, as well as Miss Medical is being sold to ICU Medical. So you think of the complexity as you know going to you're going to be now being acquired by a competitor. So it's interesting because we've done a lot of what Mark has said. <laughs> um, I could probably have, have have you know acknowledged a lot of the things that he mentioned, the accommodations of going through that process. And so when we communicated that we were delaying that that decision and the mandate. We had some people that reached out and encouraged us to continue with that. We also had people that thanked us for reconsidering. So I think, Mark, you know, great points. You just have a lot of mixed emotions. This is very personal to people. Um, there is definitely the perception of the political involvement and the decisions that the company makes. Um, and Med Device, I'm sure everyone um, that that goes into customer sites is aware that we. Um, are required by many of our customers because they're hospitals to be vaccinated. And so we have moved forward with any customer facing role. So anyone that has to be on a customer site, um, it can be our sales roles, but it could be a quality role. It could be an engineer role, um, a clinical role that you have to maybe regularly visit a customer site based on their requirements. So that's added another you know, body of work because you need to verify that um, the individuals that are going on site are vaccinated. So it adds another another thing to do and another way to make sure that we're compliant. Oh, indeed. The, the level of complexity in all of this is almost unfathomable. Um, another question that had come in from the audience, and Nikki, I might start with you if you're able to comment on it. They're asking about how you go about determining accommodations 
Can you share any of your thought process on how you determine, yes, an accommodation will or no, it won't be granted? Yeah, I'll start with the medical accommodations. Those are a little easier. We um, we have really had two processes. One was medical, one was religious. So the medical one, you know, there were certain questions that were asked and we asked for um, a medical provider to complete that form um, in conjunction with what the employee wanted to provide. So that was easier because we were looking for the support of their doctor um, to, you know, to sign off on that. And so the discussions were a little different. Um, with the religious accommodations, though, those are different. Um, and so what we really did is we had a form that the employee filled out. Um, we worked with our legal team to make sure that we were asking the right questions. But what we really did was created an interactive process where we sat down with the employee and we went through their questions. Because a lot of times what we found is there was the richness of the conversation and their belief. It wasn't just what they provided in the document. Um, what we also found was, you know, you can't just say, oh, you know, I go to this church or this is my religion because some of their beliefs might not necessarily say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Catholic or I'm Lutheran. And so it provided a little bit more of the dialogue that went, you know, into the conversation. One thing I was really proud of that we did is we actually centralized the process. So our organization is about seven, 8,000 employees. And so it was easier and that's global. So in the United States, you know, even having a smaller population, we were able to have one person that she took on all of those accommodations. So we had about 50 that came through. Um, and so she, from a consistency perspective, was able to review all of the accommodations. And then she sat down with myself, our vice president of HR and our um, general counsel. And we went through, we didn't need to know the person's name, right? We just needed to know what were the requests of the accommodations. She actually put forward recommendations. Um, and we actually went, we were, I think we, um, approved almost all of the religious ones because they hit, you know, all the points that you were looking for, you know, what is, what is your belief based in, you know, do you, do you what is the life that you live that, you know, that, um, you know, is in conjunction with that um, religious belief. Um, but through the conversations, I would say that was where the richness came in. If you're just looking at the form that the person fills out, I think you're missing an opportunity and really an opportunity to advocate. Um, once people were approved for an accommodation, then we had set up, um, you know, weekly testing was required. And then based on the state that they were in, sometimes the, uh, the organization would have to pay for that testing. Um, we asked them to continue to wear masks and then to make sure that they were following our social distancing protocol. Oh, thank you. That really helpful uh, information. And Mark, I might ask anything you would add to that, or is that similar to how you've thought about it? Uh, very similar. Nick, Nikki, spot on. It, it begins with process. Make sure you have a very clear, well-defined process. Like Nikki, we were able to have one employee truly manage, do the handholding, I'll call it. Um, it was we about 10% of the workforce at the time. Uh, so for us, it was about 30 people came forward with a varying requests for exemption of the vaccine mandate. Uh, the, me the medical ones and then the religious ones. And they're, they're slightly different. There are different standards in the courts too to be aware of and be mindful of that as well. Uh, what the paradigm we brought forward is this. We are doing this to keep our employees safe. That means we want you to stay an employee. We want to do everything we can to maintain a great relationship with each employee as they go through this process, even at the end. Uh, thankfully, we didn't have many that we couldn't come to terms with. We accommodated quite a few people. Um, the, the biggest challenge had to do with our field facing folks, our sales personnel, our service related folks, those who go in and out of our um, the hospital systems, because you're also dealing with different rules out there and standards of credentialing. Uh, so you hear the gamut of stories, uh, you know, in the New York area, for example, they have this, we hope you better be vaccinated or else and no accommodations are allowed. You have different uh, hospital systems that say that We're, we don't care. Essentially, they're telling you and the employer, we don't care what your rules are, who you're exempting from that. We're not adhering to that. So that then impacts someone's essential job functions. And we might not be able to accommodate that. That's those are difficult and challenging. So if you do this uh, for us, it was more, more than two months, more than two months of uh, you know, documentation, more than two months of back and forth interactive process with employees. And still, even to this day, you know, uh, November 15th has come and gone. We still have people that we have provided temporary accommodations, meaning the conversations continue. Um, so be, be, be mindful that if you enter into this, you're into for a very long time. Well said. And I think you know, there's a dynamic in there you hinted at earlier with the, the competitive environment, 
you know, the need to recruit and retain talent, especially for growing organizations like both of you represent. I, I want to turn now for a moment and audience members, I'll encourage you to keep the questions coming. It's fantastic to talk about the, the broader work environment and the, the competition we're all seeing. And that I, I'd be curious to start with your perspective on is this the most competitive talent environment we've ever seen or you've ever been in or has it been tougher before or is it maybe just the combination of factors brought on by the pandemic that's made it such a, a challenging environment and mark i might start with you on that one yeah so the only thing i could even begin to compare this to was the short period of time before the, the turn of 2000. And I don't know if I'm aging myself a little bit here, but I remember back in the day trying to find computer programmers to make sure we had four digits versus two and uh, paying just uh, enormous sums to uh, these, these talented folks to make the software change for us for that, that 12 month window. And then at the close of that, then of course you have these people that are overpaid. Now what do you do with them? Uh, but now we're in a, in a state where, yeah, this is unprecedented um, in my in my career. I've never seen anything like this in terms of the wage compression issues. You're bringing people on board that are making a lot more than a similar situated um, cohort employee. Um, so what we have done in challenge to that, because that is what it is. It's a challenge. And, it's, it's, and so what we did be in the summit, we had a campaign that our organization, we called the 100 Days of Staffing. And we're where we focused and it was a global effort. We said, congratulations, you're a hiring manager. Everybody's understaffed. What's your priority? If staffing isn't your top one or two, let's call it number one, Re readjust your priorities. We also then mechanically altered some of the, some of our approaches. Uh, the days of, you know, let's get a lot of people involved with the interviewing process. Let's make sure this, this candidate is vetted with 10 different uh, interviewers and 10 different sessions. During this time, I, I, I think you're foolish if, if you're not, not really challenging your own processes to speed up uh, and be more efficient with how you're processing candidates. Be very flexible. Um, the days of I must see them face to face before I hire someone, I don't, I don't think that's a rule that holds for every position. Some, I think that's, a, that's prudent. Others, you need to be more flexible. Uh, we had many, like Nikki, I'm sure will attest to, we, you make an offer to employee and 10 hours later, they get two or three other offers. And you're, um, so that, that's a real deal. So we decided to move quickly, make it a priority. We put implemented different, um, I'll call them guidelines. We did a three, five rule, meaning if it's a um, non-exempt position, no more than three people interview, make a decision. If it's exempt level, no more than five. And if you can cut that down quicker, uh, MS Teams is our go-to globally for Braco. We used MS Teams for all interviews. Uh, a few that for sales folks we wanted to see face-to-face, -face, of course, we made that happen. But the bulk of our hires come through MS Teams uh, interactive sessions just like this to make an informed decision, both for both the, the employer and the candidate. Um, and those are the challenging things. But we have, we ended the year in a better staffing position than we entered the year. And for that, I was super proud of the organization. Um, and, and we tell them that every single day. We, we implemented during the pandemic what we call an executive committee live chat. Uh, at the time, it was once a week, every Thursday for one hour, the executive team got online with our global team and talked about and checked in with them. So you have you know, 400 or so people checking in for that session and you're talking with them interactively. We've now moved that to every other week. I think that's here to stay for us. Staying connected, using this technology in this fashion, it makes... You know, this is challenging to be connected to begin with, uh, but at least we have this. And if we, we're, we're leveraging that, uh, including interviews with our um, candidates, but with our current workforce, because uh, as we all know, you can only be staff if you're retaining the good talent you have. So don't forget them as well. Yeah, well said. If, if we don't take this opportunity to rework our processes, uh, we've missed a big opportunity. And Nikki, I'd be curious from your side, what has it been like? You also have a global organization. You're seeing a lot of competition. How have you adapted and overcome in this environment? Yeah, thanks, Frank. So one of the things that we were fortunate, kind of what Mark did was we um, had already launched a new talent acquisition process and we had 
you know, I like the three, five. I think I was thinking through, I think ours is pretty consistent with that, but you're looking at the number of interviews that you're having the, the potential people go through um, and, and you're looking at candidate experience. So that was one thing. Unfortunately, we did that um, ahead of the, the challenge. <laughs> um, and then the second thing that we've done is we've increased our employer referral. So we actually doubled our employer referral. Um, and then we also extended the period of time that we would pay it out. Um, and part of that was in con you know, conjunction with, hey, let's get talent in, but then also hopefully from a retention perspective, um, how do we you know, incent our employees that are bringing in the talent to wanna continue to stay with us as well. So, um, so that those have been helpful. We definitely have seen an increase um, globally in filling our roles. Um, but unfortunately for us, one of the challenges we're facing is, you know, we are, we have, it's been public for about three years that we are, um, our parent company is wanting to sell. And so that has brought forward some retention issues and we're still we're feeling that. So we're excited to, um, the close of the sale should be in quarter one of 2022. And so we're really hoping that, you know, with that, that um, the retention and continued attraction of talent will help us, um, you know, fill the key roles that we're, we're seeing. Because ours is, you know, it's in our plants in, in, um, your hourly roles, we're seeing it in engineering roles. I mean, it's it's across the gamut that we're feeling these challenges, I'm sure everyone else is. So it's definitely for me the most challenging time in my career um, that I have seen in regards to filling roles. It, I'm wondering that it sounds like more flexibility in the way you recruit. I'm wondering if maybe you could talk about what about flexible flexibility in the work environment? So we're doing this conversation, which Two years ago would have been an in-person event, probably at some hotel venue with a group of people. Um, how have you adapted in the work environment and is it working? Do you see that continuing? You know, I'm sure there are areas we still wanna make better, but how's that going? What are you learning? Yeah, thank you. I am so thankful for technology and that we are in a place going through a pandemic like this where we have technology both home for our children um, as we think about how they've had adjusted school, but at work. So uh, Smith Medical went fully remote um, for about a year um, during the, the key parts of the pandemic. And then we started bringing our employees back in June um, part-time. And and I say this more from our corporate offices, you know, obviously that our employees that are making our products had to continue to come to work every day for us to make our products. But in roles that could be remote, we did stay remote for about a year. And then we started having employees come back to the office this summer. And by July, we had a requirement where employees had to be on site four days a week. And it did not go over well, I will say. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from employees. It was something that some of our key leaders really wanted to see. Um, and it wasn't, we lost people, people left the organization and it made our recruiting challenges even greater. But I'm happy to share that we recently announced a more flexible work um, opportunity for people so they can work um, from home up to three days a week um, in partnership with their manager if appropriate. And I would say the positive feedback that we got, um, we actually announced the mandate being changed as well as the flexible work in the same day. <laughs> and uh, I would say most of it was really positive. So people are really excited and our recruiters were jumping up and down because they know that this is gonna make their ability to find talent for managers much easier. So we're excited that that's something that we'll be looking forward into 2022 is, is more flexibility. And you, you highlight something so important, which is, you know, we have assumptions, all of us, but until we do something, we don't really know but kudos for the flexibility to then quickly respond and get to that point where, yeah, you can keep recruiting, you can keep retaining. Um, we got a question from the audience that I think is is a great one, especially right now. And Mark, I'll start with you. The, the uh, questioner is asking, how do you balance um, diverse hiring with the goal of needing to fill jobs quickly? Yeah, it's a good question. So the the nature of diversity uh, is is one of it takes many forms. You could have diversity initiatives in terms of gender, race, all of, all of that. But you also have the diversity in what is the need of the job. Where do, where does the work happen? Um, all of that factors into what I believe is a leadership mind frame of being flexible, being open minded, listen to your customers. Uh, you know, have have the strength to try some things that may be different than what you're used to doing. Knowing full well, some of them aren't gonna work. Um, the other piece of it is with the, within the leadership team, uh, there's no doubt you're gonna have differences of opinions. Uh, have, create a culture where you can share those differences of opinions in a safe manner and, and then be allowed to try things. I'm a firm believer in the free market economy. 
I believe that's what drives innovation. That, that free market economy doesn't just exist outside your, your four brick and mortar walls. Uh, they exist within your organization. Those leaders, uh, those departments that are trying things, providing more flexibility, better flexibility, uh, uh, more innovative approach and style might be the winners versus those departments who are maybe more set in the past. Be careful uh, and, and know full well, there's no guarantee that being more flexible is gonna make you a more efficient, productive employer. It might not. Uh, so be prepared for those conversations, be prepared to adapt and change. Just like Nikki said, you, you, you roll out something, you get some feedback, uh, you know, have, have the leadership um, the stamina to change if you need to change. That's, if the pandemic has taught us nothing, it's that. Be open-minded, be flexible, try different things. Uh, at at uh, Brocco Medical Technologies, thankfully, we had started the Flexible Work Arrangement Program multiple years before the pandemic. Uh, so we had two, three, four years even of uh, this historic data we had close to 15% of our workforce that took advantage of working remotely. Uh, we had some roles that were largely remotely, having a, a field-based team that they're, they're remote. That's the nature of those jobs and sales and service related folks. Um, so when the pandemic hit, it, yes, it was, uh, it was difficult, challenging, especially for our IT partners who stepped up, been amazing by the way. Um, without them, this, this would have been a, a horrific challenge even 15, 10 years ago. Um, but it, it seemed to all come together and this would launch us into the future quickly. So we, are, we have full flexible work arrangements. We have teams that, uh, jobs that need to be on site, they're on site every day because that's where the job exists. We have employer, employees that will never come into an office. That's fine too. We hire them where they live and work and, and they can be part of that conversation of where they can be the most successful they can be. And we wanna hear their voice. And we want to be flexible enough to allow them to do so uh, to, a, to our best extent. And, and then we'll see what happens in the future. We'll, we'll find out who the winners and losers are of this, but it'll take multiple years. Well said, well said. And Nikki, another one that's come in from the audience that I'd ask of you is, uh, has this environment changed how you look at contractors or consultants that might come in, say, as a bridge to full-time? Or is it just yeah, has it changed how you think about the role of contractors? I think what it's done is it, it's forced us to have to reconsider how we use contractors and temporary staff, as we would call it, because um, when there are more full times available, jobs available, and you know the, the the talent market that we're seeing right now, people you know that don't want to do contract aren't doing that, and so you have to reconsider. You know, could this be a full time job? And maybe that's the way that we should leverage it. We also have to make sure, how are we retaining our contractors? Um, are we looking if they are interested in converting them and how quickly are we converting them? We also have had to reevaluate what's our process for conversion. Um, definitely when we look at our um, plant locations, uh, we're finding that many of those people in some locations don't have as as much, com they're not as comfortable with technology. And so our process is paperless and it's very frustrating to them. So how are we helping them with that technology need and helping them to apply so they don't just run down the street and go you know work for somebody else that's maybe hiring direct um, and they're patient with us on that hiring process so yeah it's definitely something we've had to reconsider how we're using and then just consultants you know where you're you're contracting with an organization for a statement of work um, we've actually brought in more consultants to do the larger projects because we can't always find the workforce to do the work so and follow up, I think, that uh, came in over on the chat side. And folks, I'll remind you, use that Q&A function, makes it easier to moderate the questions. But uh, has this environment changed how you're looking at benefits decisions about what's offered or how you're communicating them and using that as another tool in the recruitment and retention activity? Definitely. I mean, when you think about what your company offers in regards to benefits, um, you know, what is, you know, what is that piece that you would say, this is a recruitment tool for us? This is something that we want to offer. Do we have really great benefits? Is our premium is really competitive? Maybe your 401k. I would say Smith Medical has a great 401k program. And that's something that we lead with when we think about um, our employees. But benefits is something that I think we need to continue to evaluate 
um, my prior organization actually did a really great job of, um, they were starting to offer pet insurance and you could, you know, get, you know, have an attorney and there were different, now you had to use the dollars that the company provided you or pay more out of pocket for certain things. It wasn't all free, um, but it was a way for us to think about, you know, how could we be more competitive? So that's something I hope um, other employers continue to do to, uh, uh, you know, understand what the needs of their employees are and also from a, an attraction of talent perspective with their benefits. Well said. And uh, another question coming in from the audience, Mark, I'll ask you on starting with this one. Uh, the question is asking about earn and learn models to recruit and retain workers. I think they're getting at uh, how are you building in career pathways or progressions and development models into it? And has that changed as a result of the, uh, the pandemic or the tough recruiting environment? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's really changed as much as it's it's one of those things if you want to, in this competitive landscape, you have to be able to demonstrate and show that you care about someone's career, especially if you're in an organization that is trying to convert interns and co-ops into full-time jobs. You have to have dedicated personnel to build programs and processes to keep them uh, interacting with them and having them connect with leaders and then talking to them about their future within our organization. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, within Bracco is expand our reach. So we are, we are uh, I would say, a combination of multiple uh, divisional companies throughout the globe. Our leaders in Milan have seen this as an opportunity, getting our divisions more connected. So down the road, we will be building global career boards. We will have global programs to show that there's not opportunities outside of BMT. There's other divisions that are in uh, desperate need of talent. We might have a, a, a talent or two here that we need to share. Uh, so if you're of a size uh, that you can leverage that stuff, leverage it, but know it's going to have some cost, know it's going to take some time, energy, and effort, but because of the nature of what, what I would say, we all heard about the supply chain challenges globally, right, for materials. That, it's, it's real. It exists. Everybody's working hard at it. There is a supply chain challenge of labor, and I, I would challenge anyone to uh, estimate which one will be solved first. I don't know the answer to that. But, but they're, they're here with us now. Uh, I think labor supply is, uh, I believe, my opinion, it will take longer for us to try to solve labor supply issues than, than material supply issues in some cases. So buckle in. Yeah, I think you've both highlighted this point of process improvement, of engaging leadership, of the teams being involved. And I'll just, I'll comment as I've grown in my role and now I'm in a position where I'm doing more hiring, I'm managing people, I take everything you've said, both of you, to heart, where I'm realizing more and more, like my job is recruit and retain. Everything else is solved if we recruit great people and we keep them. Like after that, every other problem, including I'd say supply chain, it's never easy, but becomes easier if we all as leaders spend that time up front recruiting and then retaining great people. So I really appreciate what you're sharing. Um, I wanna ask kind of a related piece. We've talked a little bit about like benefits, about pay, about flexibility. Something that's often been talked about though is, you know, we work in healthcare, it is a good industry. It does good things. There is a mission to it, no matter what we're doing. And that, that's really been challenged the last couple of years where we've seen the strains on healthcare. Uh, and as hard as we try, the strains are still there. So I, I want to start this phase of the discussion with a question around like, is that halo still there? Is it still a motivating factor to people to, to work in healthcare and to, to do the good that is out there? Is that still a tool that we all have in bringing great people into this? And, Nikki, I'll start with you on that question. Yeah, I definitely think it it is. Um, you know, we are in a really hard time, right? Going through a pandemic and the impacts that that has to people, both their health, and then when you work in um, an industry that is impacted. So whether it's, you know, you work in the dental field and you have to wear more PPE or you're working in the hospitals where people are physically coming in and, and you're short staffed. But I think there is still the appeal here. I mean, we, we can't, um, we all, we're all aging. <laughs> we're all going to need healthcare. 
Um, and so I think we've learned a lot about, you know, just, just the, um, the virtual doctor's visits. I mean, looking to see how the, the healthcare industry has, has shaped or how, you know, med device and how important our devices are to people. Um, so I think if we continue to work to solve our supply chain issues and we look at our labor issues, I really do hope and feel that, you know, the, um, the desire to work in healthcare doesn't go away because we know that we all need it. I do think that we all, though, need to be honest with ourselves to say we've, we've learned a lot through these challenges. And if we have to go through something like this again, you know, how do we do it differently? What are things that we admit to ourselves didn't go well that we need to be prepared for? I mean, we, when we think of this all started in what, March of 2020 in the United States in, in particular, you know, there was the admittance that they didn't have the extra stock in for the PPE and things like that. So I think there's just a lot that we've just learned from as a society, much less um, what employers can do and how we can continue continue to make sure we're attracting the talent to our industry and making it a place that people want to be. Right on. Mark, what about you? How is, is the halo still there, still an attractive tool? Oh, I, I believe that having a strong mission and what we're doing is paramount. Uh, and, 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 and yell that from the mountaintop, if you will, uh, because you will find the talent who are looking for meaning in work and, and looking for meaning if, if you're able to work in the workforce for 40 plus years, when you're done and you look back, are you going to feel proud about your accomplishments in, in, in the industry of medical device? How much more proud could you get? You're saving lives. You know, I share this story when I'm talking to some candidates once in a while, but for me personally, I lost a father due to a bad heart valve. One of the divisional companies I work with within Brocco manufactures transcatheter aortic valves. And so part of this is I have a strong personal connection with helping the team members build, manufacture, get these things on the market to save people like my father. Find a mission. Talk about that mission. You will touch hearts. You will touch lives. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing as leaders within our organization, our, our employees' lives, and that, then our patients, our customers, and, and which they which they tend to on a daily basis. So yeah, I think mission is more important than, than ever. And I'm, I'm damn proud to be in the medical device, that's for sure. Well said, and it maybe continuing on that, you know, we know that the mission, belonging, feeling a part of something is just, is kind of an innate thing in human nature. Uh, and we used to do that in many ways with having a great space to work in, bringing people together, socializing, gathering. We're now more limited in our ability to do that. And so, Nikki, I'll, I'll start with you. Could you talk about you know, how do you keep that sense of belonging when we're in a, a hybrid or sometimes a fully remote environment? And Mark will ask you the same question. Nikki, if you would. Yeah, I think it's leveraging the technology. So I think Mark has had provided a really couple of great examples his organization has done, and we've done some things similarly. So how are you getting your, your workforce together and bringing them um, you know, through updates, what's going on? Um, even if you don't have it, like I, I keep referencing the sale of our company, but even when we don't have an update, it's still on people's minds. They want to know, we don't know anything anymore right now, right? We're waiting to hear. Um, I also think it has down to, you know, your mission and your value. So how are you demonstrating those values and bringing your people together? So a couple of things that we do is we um, have a CEO, a quarterly CEO, um, each value, someone is nominated for that. Um, and then we have the America's president, um, which the, our, our call comes up here shortly. And he he actually has people nominate every two weeks to be recognized based on the value. So I think those are great ways to bring people together. I think it's also just about giving leaders tools. So how are leaders and what tools are you giving your leader so that as a leader, they, they're they developing their talent, um, making permission to still do things to bring people together. So maybe you used to do happy hours and that doesn't feel right now or people are choosing to be remote. So how can you lead your team meetings in a way that people still get the break and have some fun, do some laughs. We did family feud yesterday for our holiday and it was, it was remote. It was, it was super fun. I was one of the, the hosts and, you know, people laughing and getting together. So I think it's just being creative. And so that's the one thing I worry about with being so remote at times is, is we lose the, what do they call it? The water cooler talk opportunity. And I think making sure you're still providing those, encouraging those of your employees and then bringing those together in your leadership meetings as well. Yeah. Well said that the intentionality really comes through that like the, the water cooler piece was a thing that just kind of happened because we were in the environment. We don't have that. So we all now have to step into it a bit more, be more intentional. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Mark, what about you? How has it been for Bronco and for the work you're doing? 
Yeah, when it, when it comes to the, the techno technology leveraging MS Teams, we use MS Teams globally as an organization. We announce it, say, hey, if you work for Bracco, you're using MS Teams. So come, that familiarity helps. Even this is a Zoom call, which is fine. Pick a pick a path, leverage that as best that you can. The other piece I would add, and I, I agree with everything Nikki just said. I think as a as a leader of people, more more now than ever before, you have to be intentional, and you actually have to take more time to do things for your team. Um, one of those things that some leaders, with myself, struggle from is like the day to day busyness. You kind of get caught up in the whirlwind, and you forget about your team that is relying on you. They need your time. Build that into your schedule. Build event, some event planning. I think will be a new, uh, new discipline of a people leader skill. It's time to really be thoughtful of planning events, getting people together when it's safe and smart. I think that's really critical. And I, and I do worry like Nikki does is the, the lack of being connected, especially think of a new uh, employee uh, coming into your organization. And then think of that new employee. This is their, maybe their first job ever. What are you doing with their onboarding? How are you leveraging technology to get them the information they need so they understand your business, their job, but are connected with the people? What processes are you building? What, what technology can you extend to them to, to make that a great start? Because if you miss that opportunity that first year or so, you may have lost a great employee for the next four years. Um, you know, so do, spend more time with those new employees as well. And uh, Mark, maybe you could extend on that a bit more. What are some of the things that you've seen work in kind of getting that that water cooler or more social aspect together? Um, Nikki, you talked about the family feud and other things. I'll ask you the same thing, though. But Mark, what are some of the things you've seen work to maintain that kind of cohesion? Yeah, one thing we, we, I think I mentioned our EC live chats every Thursday morning for an hour. We do that. Just had one today. It was great. Uh, wish them a happy holidays and going through business updates. Uh, another thing that my team put together for new hires was new hire networking events. So when you're a new hire, you are connected with others that came aboard uh, with the organization around the same time you are. So we put them together, whether we can get them physically together or through a virtual session with training. Hey, here's our uh, some of our medical device equipment. I want y'all to see it, how it operates. We have our trainers show them how to dismantle, but how, how they work um, and also have sessions. How is it going? So they can interact with one another. We also have uh, networking sessions with leaders. So our employees can get together, especially new hires with, with leadership uh, throughout their first year. So they get a chance to, to meet one another. Uh, so we've leveraged that with some, some really good success, I would say. Thank you. I appreciate that. Nikki, what about you? What, what sort of things have you seen work? Yeah, we actually launched a mentorship program during this and it was, um, you know, it's, it's, it was smaller. I think we had 25 pairs originally. Um, so we're on our second cohort now. And what's really neat is we were very intentional about how we connected people. So it was cross-functional and global. Um, and so we've gotten so much great feedback that people really felt like, you know, this was such a great time to do this because of where everybody was at. And because we weren't you know, in a position at times as a company to do some of the programs we had used in in-person training. And so people had felt that their development was, you know, put to the wayside. And so we're doing it, you know, for the second cohort um, and adding in some different um, subjects and things like that, but just really great. It's focused on diversity as well as development. So we brought in a, um, we did some um, unconscious bias training. We're doing an un a reverse mentoring session. Um, and those have been helpful. Um, I know we've also encouraged leaders, you know, if you are bringing your teams on site, so there is a kind of that flexible where people are, you know, maybe pick a day each week that your team comes in together and you don't have to buy them lunch if you, you know, it get, can get expensive to do that every week. But if you encourage your team to do, you know, a, a coffee chat or um, maybe eat lunch together. Um, and so how are you, when, when they are on site, are you encouraging them to come together to do um, things? I know I've also just seen some of the personal relationships that have started to develop with the staff and really encourage them. Actually, I've said, I'm so glad that you have found a work friend that you feel comfortable with, that you can you know, connect with. Um, so intentionally pairing them and making buddies as you onboard new employees, for sure, when they're remote, because I think to Mark's point, you know, if we don't um, help these new people feel connected, and if you think about all the hiring our companies are doing right now, because we have lost talent, we are bringing in a lot of new people, and we need to make sure that we, 
make sure they're connected. And it's not just the manager's job to do that. You know, how does the team take responsibility? How do you, again, find a buddy or a partner um, to help them um, learn more about the organization and maybe be a go-to person that they might feel more comfortable asking some of, uh, is this a dumb question type of thing, even though we know there's no dumb question. <laughs> Indeed. Well, and that I think is a, a great place to wrap it up. A fantastic discussion. And what I heard is kind of the three big themes, if I put it together, were intentionality of action, of engagement, uh, communications, or even over communications to make sure people feel like they know what's going on, they're part of what's going on. And then just the, the perspective that we're all in this together and we're all kind of going through the same set of challenges. Um, maybe it's not the greatest set of challenges, but at least we know we're all in the same boat and we're all working together to try to figure them out. So I want to say to everyone who participated today, thank you for spending your time. Thank you for the great questions. To Nikki and Mark, thank you for sharing your experiences and your knowledge. You represent what makes the Medical Alley community so great and so strong. And one last ask to have of everyone out there, this last question was a really good one. If there are things that have worked for your organization, send me a note, you know, just use the info at medicalalley.org, send any ideas you've had, uh, we'll put them together and we'll share them around with the group, because it sounds like there's a bunch of different things that each of us are trying, maybe together, we'll come up with a, a better set of opportunities. And with that, I'll say to everyone, thank you, have a great rest of your day. If you are at the office, the roads may be a little slick, drive safely. And if you're working from home, I hope you have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. See you in the new year.